Morning, Eric. Hello. Hi. I'll let Terry in here. Hmm. Can everybody hear me okay? All good? Yes. Excellent. <clears throat> Wait for Terry to come online. There she is. Yeah. Hello, Oops. Terry. <laughs> Hello. And we need Allison here to make a complete picture. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, so just want to welcome you to this session. I've got some slides if we need them, but mostly I just wanted to say hello and see what drew you to the conversation today. Just get an idea of why you're here and what you're looking for, and it'll help me sort of focus what we choose to present. This is the part where you all jump in and start talking. <laughs> uh -huh. David, your video is off. Do you know that? Is that I don't know that. It says it's on. Let me turn it off and then back on. Is that better? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you are. Yeah. It said it was on. So thank you for putting the off. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. On my side, it was fine. So yeah. um, I, I'm Eric Spry coming to you from Seattle, and I'm here because Russ Taylor told me to come here. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, well, actually, I've been. I'm, been kind of hearing bits about your work here and there, and I'm interested in just learning more. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. I'm yep. Russ Taylor, also in Seattle, and I uh, uh, I enrolled in the uh, narrative coaching program for 2024. So I just um, this is part of sort of gearing up for that for me. Okay, excellent. And Terry. Yes. Hi, David. I uh, got a chance to participate uh, in that Finding Our Way Forward um, session last this year uh, with you and Allison, and that got me interested in your work and the chance to go deeper. Okay. And I'm and I and I'm not sure if narrative coaching or the ID way is the mm -hmm. best route, but I wanted to join today to understand more about okay. narrative coaching and all right. And are you, um, I think tomorrow we have a conversation about the ID way. Are you able to attend? I am not. It's a, okay. it a conflict. So, um, so if you want to stay on, uh, you know, towards the end of this call, I'm happy just to spend a few minutes and share with you about that program just to help you out. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And how about for others? Hi, Perry Strawn from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I've done some work with Allison and a lot of other places encountering your work and just super curious about how this approach might fit into work I'm doing in adult development and parts work and things like that and grateful okay. for the morning together. Sure. <clears throat> and Eva, I think our paths have crossed in the story world. Is that my memory is correct? They have, they have. Yeah. I just wow. checked and I think we met 10 years ago. Wow. So that's a long time ago. <laughs> and yeah. I've followed your work ever since. Um, read your book. Uh, I am trying to find new ways to do coaching. Mm -hmm. I've been a coach for 20 years. Um, and I think you have it all very structured more than I have. So I just have to take in bits and pieces along mm -hmm. the way. So what I'm really looking forward to is uh, structure. I think I'm on the waiting list for this year. So huh. maybe I can squeeze in between Eric and Russell. And Russell. Okay. And welcome to um, David, who just joined us. Um, so David, we're just checking in about what brought people to here today and what they're curious about. Um, hi, yes, sorry, and uh, fashionably late as well, apologies. Um, ringing from, from Dublin, uh, I did a transformational coaching course uh, two years ago. I do coaching and consulting. Uh, my background is uh, communications, so mm. uh, narratives and storytelling are quite interesting, and it feels like there's a Venn diagram with an intersection here, which is what okay. brought me to explore the intersection. Great. And Anna, I saw you, your dog is visiting us today, too, as well. I'm, I'm wondering what uh, you all would like from the call today. So I'm I'm planning my 2024, and I figured this would be, I, I love storytelling, and uh, so I figured maybe this is the thing I do want to do for 2024. Okay, and what part of the world are you in? 
I'm in Miami. Okay. In Wonderful. Yes. And I apologize in advance because I'm, I'm babysitting a dog and <laughs> so. We, we, I think we have a lot of uh, narrative coach dogs in the world because they like to hang out when their owners or <laughs> are on in class. So my the other one <laughs> i don't know okay <laughs> okay thank you and elka did you want to share anything this morning sure for me it's not morning for me it's afternoon David. okay and where are you I'm calling in from germany okay i'm in germany um and i've been quite intrigued with the whole idea of narrative coaching mm -hmm. i've done a lot of coaching um, I I think you did some work with Ian Witcherly years and years ago in the UK. Oh yeah, wow, um, yes, very, very much so. So he was my my um, dissertation supervisor when I did my MA in coaching and mentoring, and so ever since I've been a little intrigued and learning and looking up videos. And so today I thought, like, actually, let me be curious and let me come. Okay, and what part of Germany are you in? I am in the northern part, snowed in at the moment, okay. and thoroughly enjoying the Advent season. All right. Well, I'll, I'll be in your fine country in, in a few days, so I'm looking forward to it. I bring warm clothes. I know. <laughs> I've got them already packed. It takes up half Good my suitcase. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, let me just put up a few slides, and as we go along... Um, just um, feel free to shout out if you've got questions or you want to explore something further. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so just as a bit of context, so I created narrative coaching um, about 25 years ago uh, in the course of um, completing my PhD. Um, I realized uh, I've been working in the coaching space for that long. Um, and I realized that a lot of what I observed uh, uh, as a grief counselor and a few other things that about how people actually changed and grew wasn't as neat and tidy as a lot of the more traditional models of coaching. And I found that rather than try to agonize over perfect questions or whatever, I would allow our humans to do what humans do best, which is to tell stories. And, and given my, my background, I found some very powerful ways to help people be witnessed in their own stories um, as a storyteller um, in the story material they chose and then the act of telling, which often revealed quite a bit um, somatically from them. And so we've created over time a body of work, which is in some ways quite unique in the coaching space. Um, and I would like to be able to just share a bit about that with you. Um, so I just kind of start here as a bit of context, just kind of reassure, reassure uh, what I just said. Um, I'm observing now that the world became awash in coaches during the pandemic, um, and we still are sort of subscribing to some frames around coaching, which again, I don't know as if they're as fitting with what we understand about developing adults, and I'm finding that they're, uh, um, the narrative coach approach has a lot of resonance in this sort of world we live in now, where people are hungry for better stories and more truthful stories and kind of trying to find their way in, in this world. And so part of what's enriching the program now is I'm uh, finishing up a big report for the Institute of Coaching at Harvard um, on what's called the five maturities. So one of the things I'll say from, from many of our participants um, is that they're grateful for who they became in the program as much as what they learned, because you'll find that it actually will free you up to coach in a more natural and authentic human way. And the way that we do our program is the first third of the program is about yourself. Um, because uh, we can only really travel as far with our clients as we've gone ourselves. It doesn't mean we've had to experience the exact same things or gone the exact same places. But for example, if you've not ever really addressed grief in your life well, and you have a client who's experiencing a great loss, there's only so much you can do because you've never taken that road for yourself. And so now, why we do a lot of work on ourselves as narrative coaches is so we can hold bigger and bigger spaces for our clients to to do the work that they're about. Um, and so you've had a chance to share a bit about kind of what you drew to this, this session. As always, if you've got questions as we come go, just again, I'll keep the chat box open so I'll be able to track that or you can just raise your hand 
either one's fine. Um, so let me just get over here. Um, so we'll talk a bit about what makes narrative coaching unique and, and what's it like to be a narrative coach. And then we'll cover all the logistics of the program itself at the very end. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of humor. <clears throat> um, this is how um, coaching often felt to me in the beginning. It just felt rather absurd. Um, and um, so for me, we're quite immersive in this work. This person is having been a lifeguard. This person is drowning, wants assistant that, that they don't want to lecture. Um, and so we you'll find and um, we do a lot of things we, that we call serious play in narrative coaching, which means we have a very sort of engaged and um, active style of coaching in a way, um, which paradoxically is paired with our commitment to silence. Um, and you'll see more about that in a few minutes, but we don't do this. We don't do any of these things here. Um, so I want to just make like a really simple distinction uh, to kind of articulate kind of what we do in narrative coaching. So if I were to oversimplify what how um, traditional coaching operates, the coach asks questions and we're often trained in asking powerful questions. Uh, they think their clients think about our questions, they answer our questions, and then our listening is really in service of our formulation, our sort of our story about what we think is going on, which then informs the next question that we ask. All of that's good, fine. I mean, those are all good skills to be able to ask good questions, to be able to hear people as they're talking, to be able to respond well to what they're saying. All of that's wonderful. The problem that I've observed over time is that what happens is this cycle starts to speed up. And, and then it starts to get more complex as the client says more things. And pretty soon what I observe, in, particularly in newer coaches, and then they're up in their head the whole time then, uh, worried about what I, I've got to ask, what's the next question I'm supposed to ask? So they've actually, after a while, can tend to stop listening fully because they're already trying to gear up what's the best next question I could ask. And so again, that's the skills that are involved in this graphic are totally fine and they're actually very useful in coaching. And we're finding that what happens is despite the coach's intention, the conversation ends up being dominated by and directed by the coach's questions. It goes where the questions take the conversation, which is not where, I, in my view, where we would like to take a coaching conversation. Um, and so what happens in this is that the attention gets focused on the coach and the methodology, neither of which have a lot of impact on the outcomes uh, based on the research. And so I thought I want to create something a little bit different. So the starting point in narrative coaching is uh, us serving as a witness to what the client just said. Our attentions on what we call the field or the energetic space, conversational space between the two people, kind of what's happening in the present moment and on the coaching relationship as a container for the work. So when we, uh, when we witness the client as they're telling their story, we're inviting them uh, to not answer our questions, but to inquire into themselves and into the moment that we're in. So one of our most common narrative coaching questions would be, what are you noticing about yourself right now? And we do that because a lot of times people are just telling their story. They're not even aware that they're doing that. And we want to help them become more aware of themselves. <clears throat> um, and so as they're starting to narrate their experience, we want them to do that with more and more sort of consciousness in a way. And so we might, um, and so then we listen and observe, but our observations are of them, not our reflections about therefore, what should I do? And so our next uh, engagement is to witness what we saw. <clears throat> and so we might say, Gosh, I noticed when you um, talked about your boss and your story, your face kind of crinkled up or you seemed more hesitant or <clears throat> your voice changed or you slumped in your chair or um, I'm wondering why that character keeps coming back. Um, and so everything we're doing is enriching the client's understanding of themselves and equipping them to basically coach themselves in a way. What this means is that we can we don't have to uh, over effort to try to make the conversation go somewhere, but in reality we can help shape it based on what's emerging for um, for the the coachee. Um, <clears throat> and so um, one of the things that we do is we try to keep questions simple, uh, direct, um, 
And again, keep the attention away from ourself in a way. So the client gets drawn deeper and deeper into their own experience. And that then the, the discernment and the discoveries can um, emerge uh, for their, from there. So I'm just going to stop there for a minute and just sort of see if anything is coming up for you for right now. I'm going to stop sharing so we can see each other um, and see if anything thus far and just here in the beginning is resonating for you or uh, drawing some curiosity in you. Um, and then we'll um, we'll move on and talk some more about some of the more um, intricacies of narrative coaching. Well, I'm curious about, um, as you're talking about establishing the field um, <clears throat> with a client and sidebar, um, coachy always feels like it's something that's being done to the person. So I prefer the word client. Um, but uh, how do you, I guess the word would be contract, but how do you explain when you're starting with a client um, what you're proposing to do with them? Yeah, so one of the things we don't do is we don't tend to set agendas at the start of a conversation. And we we do that because I've in, having done this for, for 25 years, it is extraordinarily rare that a coaching conversation ends anywhere near where it began. It's very rare for a client to really un fully understand why they're actually there or what they actually really want or what's actually really possible. And so uh, for me, frankly, I find it a waste of time to try to guess why we're in that conversation and for the coach E or the client to have to articulate that. So in the model that we teach you in the program, the first phase is called situate. Um, my, only, um, my only objective in the first part of a coaching conversation is to welcome the person into the room help them feel safe, help them build trust, help them notice themselves. Because the more I can do that, the more they can get clear about why they're really there. And so we we tend to then, um, in terms of describing this to people, I found the easiest way to describe narrative coaching is to demonstrate it for them. And, and to model kind of how we approach people, which tends to be quite um, nourishing for people and it's surprising because they're what you know what are the three objectives for today and what you get caught up in a lot of the western mindset which I don't find very helpful we save all of our uh, kind of galvanizing or organizing energy around that kind of stuff to the end when they're trying to make decisions and choices and own something um, that then that's more sort of bounded um, uh, approach is actually quite useful in the beginning I find not and I want to um invite the person that showing up for the conversation to just really drop into why are you really here what is really possible for you today what are you actually ready for um and so if you think about like a um somebody who comes in and said i'm thinking about applying for this new job or i just lost my job or my uh works are chaotic because we just downsized or whatever their presenting problem is the, th the work to be done probably has some relationship to the problem, but it's not the same. And so you could have 10 people coming to you all lost th their job at the same time, and you'd be in 10 different coaching conversations. They'd all revolve around the fact that they've all just like their team's been, you know, take, um, dropped out of the organization or they all have a, a similar precipitating event. But what they're ready for and they're going to need from you is going to be different for each person. So we just welcome them, say, you know, and say, I'm sorry to hear that you've lost your job. What, what, what feels important to you today about that? Oh, I don't know how to tell my partner because I feel embarrassed that I lost my job or gosh, we our family really needs some money. Now I'm really worried about money or, oh God, thank God I couldn't stand that job. I'm so glad <laughs> I'm not there anymore. I didn't realize how much I didn't want that job until they let me go. So we, we don't, um, we don't try to know it right away. And we just sort of are with the experience of them showing up and starting in their story. And we start to notice what seems to be um, most present for them in that conversation. A any other thoughts or questions for right now? It feels so natural and relaxing. It is, yes. 
when I used to, when I started coaching 25 years ago, I could have like two or three clients in a day and come home and need a nap. I was exhausted. <laughs> and now I can run retreats all day long and it doesn't take any energy at all because I'm not, that's not my job is to effort. My job is to love my clients and to be present to them and help them find what they need. Um, but it, it, it ends up feeling like a much more natural conversation. So, David, then, as you described, the beginning of the program is some um, unlearning for us that uh, yes. this not knowing, you know, this being willing to suspend mm -hmm. some of that that in ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Anything so, more? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Is there something else you're going to say that I missed? Okay. No. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So part of it is learning to manage our own anxiety. Uh, to about being in the unknown with our client. We don't know any more than they do. Um, and um, if you think about all the, you know, so much of the big choices or big changes we made in our life, all required us to move into unknown spaces. You know, we've always been single and now we got married. I've never been married for that person. I've, I've never been married. So how would I know what it means to really be married? I know stories or observations or, you know, um, but I've never had that experience. So how could I know? Um, and so we live in a world now that's just uncertainty is everywhere. So the fantasy that we could be certain, um, the certainty will come, but just not in the order that we often wish it would. Um, and so our job is to help ourself and our client just be present to what is. Um, and so we, one of the things that people really appreciate is that we, um, we do our best to not be judgmental of our clients. Everything is fine. Everything is welcome. Um, and, um, you know, I think it was Perry, I think you were the one that was talking about parts work. Yeah. Yes. So we've done, I've, we, we don't label them that way, but we've done parts work since the beginning because a lot of what we're doing in, in my world, it's we work with the shadow a lot, but um, we're trying to help people um, find a greater sense of wholeness for themselves. That often means recovering parts of themselves that didn't fit their story before, um, and they, but that that they might need now. Um, and so we try to focus. Uh, we do our best to focus on what would help this person most right now. Again, one of the things that we have, you know, we we try to help people achieve whatever is important to them. But by and large, our focus is really only on um, what does this person need most right now. We don't tend to set. We don't tend to set goals. You can if you want. Um, we're not going to teach you that because. But if you want to set goals, that's fine. But I find that goals take people away from their bodies, away from themselves, and they start chasing things. Um, we create other. We have other avenues to help people succeed. Um, and goals can be fine if they're useful to you. But um, we try to find a way to help people. Just really look at what is the next step in the direction you're trying to head. I think um, even more so now, uh, and traditionally we um, ended up, sometimes if we weren't careful as coaches acting like cheerleaders. And um, I find that people um, now, um, many of our clients, many of us get overwhelmed by the nature of the world we live in. And so we're, I feel like um, coaching often becomes too ambitious or too dramatic or big. And so um, we just um, help people take the next step and then sort of see what the world likes, looks like from that place. And what are you noticing now that you didn't before? Or what do you have available to you, you didn't before? And what is the next step you want to take? And so we tend to focus on fewer things, but we go more deeply on them. So they actually stick. Um, yeah. Yeah, Perry. Well, as you're speaking, I can't help but think of the complexity theory, Dave mm -hmm. Snowden, all that, where, yes, so much complexity. So can we take one step to begin to untangle and see how the world looks from there? So I was just curious yeah. that and, you know, informs your thinking and work. It did a long time ago because I used to do a lot of large scale change projects. And a lot of my coaching work was supporting people to have better conversations in the midst of change, particularly for leaders who often were awful at communicating about change. Um, 
And um, so I did a lot of work on uh, complexity and knowledge management, all that kind of stuff way back when. It doesn't show up directly in the work anymore, but it's certainly in the fabric of uh, where narrative coaching came from. Okay. Well, let me just, um, oh, Eva. 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 Okay, sorry, I stand corrected. Thank you. I just want to want to say that what you're saying is probably what worries me most about the coaching environment today. That it's all you called it Western thinking earlier, yeah. I think. This idea that um you set a goal and then you get there and you evaluate and you set a new goal. And I for quite a few years I felt that things get lost. And that very linear approach of just achieving goals one after the other. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense to just be in the process and, and discover yeah. things in the process. Um, so I, like I've been really motivated in that um, uh, by, by I have a great fascination with elite athletes and elite musicians and how do they get really good at what they do. And and so like some of the research in this field of sports would suggest that the highest um, injury uh, rate or, uh, is, occurs right before breaks because people have taken their mind off the game and they're thinking about resting in the locker room or getting the ice bath or whatever they're going to do next. And, um, and so they, their, their body and their mind separate. Um, and that's when we get hurt. And so I think about so many of, if you've had accidents in your life or even tr tripping or whatever, it's often because we're lost in our thought. We're not in our body. Um, and so we're trying to keep this um, as ex incarnated as possible. There's an, a great apocryphal um, story, which means we don't know if it's really true, but it should be true because it's a great story uh, by um, a well-known uh, uh, African-American uh, blues and jazz. Um, I think he was a pianist. Um, and they were you know, just doing a lot of, they were in, in interviewing him about how he got so good at what he does. And it, when they were going, curious, like, where did you get your musical training? And, you know, do you, do you uh, uh, how do you train yourself? He said, yeah, I studied music. And he said, I, I, I studied music up until the point it got in the way of my playing. And then I stopped. And I thought, that's, I was inspired by that. So I, I've got four degrees sitting behind this and all of that's available in the program, but that's not what the look, work looks like. It just supports the work to show that it's credible. Um, and um, so a lot of the assignments and things we give you in the program are actually quite practical um, for that reason. Um, so let me just go back here and there we go. Um, <clears throat> So, although you just enjoyed this picture for a minute, it goes, this goes back to um, the comment that was um, made before. <clears throat> this is for you, Terry. Um, so we're gonna invite you to put down all your boulders or at least wear more sensible shoes when you're carrying boulders. <laughs> um, so uh, many of you will come to this um, program with, with um, things you've acquired that you think coaching is supposed to be in the past. And a lot of that will still be useful. So we're not throwing all that away. We're just saying we're going to prioritize um, some different things. So for me, I'd much rather be the person on the right on our bike, free to ride with your friends out in the countryside, as opposed to efforting to bring all this stuff to the session. Um, and so a lot of the beginning, as Terry was wondering uh, about the program, are just basically inviting you to put all the rocks down, and then some. Then and then, at the, uh, as you go and at the end, you're welcome to pick up as many of them as you like again. So again, they're not in the, in, in necessarily bad in themselves. They're just often, I find, getting in the way of the freedom of what a natural coaching conversation should be like. Um, and so we um, we sort of act like tugboats in narrative coaching. So we're not across from a client. We're not. We're not doing coaching to a client. We're walking alongside a human being that's trying to do something, to move through a change, to uh, to understand themselves better, to become a better leader or parent or whatever they're after. And we're walking. And so when we used to do more live programs before the pandemic, a lot of our practices were done with people asking people to go out on the grounds 
and just walk side by side as they have a coaching conversation. And then if they want to stop and face each other for whatever reason, they can do that. But the the your, the client who comes to see you uh, is to varying degrees already in the journey of change. They're going to be on the journey of change after they've done seeing you. You've just got this little piece of time to kind of help them maybe turn their boat a little bit or get more become more aware of the water or the current. Um, and so we're not bringing change to them. We're actually supporting them in a change process they're already in. And so I just want to give you sort of the six quick principles of this work. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so um, the first one is the, in some ways the most important only because if you forget all the rest of this and you remember this one, you'll do really well. Um, so we have a fundamental trust that everything we need is right in front of us. And so if you're in the middle of a narrative coaching session and you like you blank out, which happens to all of us, or the client's uh, story is very convoluted and you've kind of lost the threads and you're like, and you, and you're, and you find yourself going back in your head, oh, I've got to figure this out and I've got to understand this and this doesn't make any sense and blah, blah, blah. Well, just relax and come back. To what, what's right in front of you right now? A human being is trying to tell a story. Um, and so we, uh, we, even when clients are talking about the past or the future, we bring everything into the present moment because that's the only moment it really exists in. And um, we're working with the stories that are told in the session or could be told in the session. Um, as much as possible, we stay away from jargon and we work only with as much as we can with the language and uh, elements in the stories as they're told. Um, we do our best to try to stay fully present to our clients and particularly to what is. So we're often advocates for what is in terms of what we notice about a client, for example, that they're not noticing yet about themselves. We do so from a, we don't make any prescriptive judgments about whether something is good or bad. They just are. Um, and um, so somebody comes in and they have a really bad relationship with their a teammate or a boss or whomever. We don't make efforts in the beginning to try to change that. We acknowledge, oh, so I'm hearing you say that you, you're not happy with your relationship with your boss. And then we begin to explore what that's like and how did they come to not like it and what it would be like if they liked it. And we've just found that uh, often coaches get really eager when they think they understand what's happening to try to go solve that problem. And that whatever the presenting problem is, is often not the problem. And even framing something as a problem completely transforms how you respond. So we just look at things that they're just what is. Um, and so the more that we could get our clients to be present to what is, the more truth they can tell about themselves, about the situation, and the more open they tend to be in the end, if they trust you. Um, and if we leave out the judgments for, the, for now, then um, they're, they're more able to see and to feel and to notice. And therefore, we have much more to work with. Judgments can come later when they decide they want or don't want something, but for the present, we leave that out. Um, we borrowed a piece from Ram Das, so speak only when you can improve on silence. And uh, for our uh, and us, for us, um, that's not as often as we think. <laughs> um, we use silence a lot. Um, when I used to travel around the world teaching this stuff, like to graduate coaching programs, it was very perplexing to most of the students because um, I would ine inevitably be coaching one of their peers, and um, my coaching demos were rarely more than 10 minutes because we didn't need that much time. And they were very frustrated because they said, um, well, we've been talking with him for all year and he hasn't, he shared more with you in 10 minutes than he shared with us in a year. How did how that happen? Plus you just sat there and you didn't say anything. I said, I'm not being paid to say stuff, right? I'm being paid to help a client have the experience they need to achieve what's important to them. And sometimes I'll talk if I feel it improves on the silence, but the silence is actually not something that's, um, and we'll teach you this in the program, but silence is not what happens after you stop talking. That's just not talking. It's not silence. Silence is the ground in which we're working. And so we want to use words and, and, and uh, present in ways when that is, can add value to silence. Um, and then in terms of working with the clients themselves, um, we do our best to generate experiences, not explanations. So what that means is 
sometimes in coaching, we can get caught up in labels and, um, you know, uh, fancy words from psychology. Um, and we believe that if our clients understood what was going on, they would do something differently. But uh, explanations are often overrated. Um, and what um, what I observed pretty early on in coaching was that what most, particularly in workplaces, but even in like in families, what most of our clients lacked more than anything was a safe place to practice. It's why I stopped teaching leadership programs because it didn't matter how they did in the program, but I knew the kind of env work environments many of these people were returning to. There's no way in heck that they're going to do these things under pressure back at work. And so if we, uh, so maybe you're trying to work on somebody who's just been promoted to being a leader and they've always been sort of an independent contributor and now all of a sudden they've got to give directions and they've got to, you know, share a vision and they've got to like, and get people to do things and they're not they don't feel very confident because they don't have a lot of life experience asserting themselves well i want to give them you know handouts or readings or you know, try to understand why it is that way and these are all explanations which can be helpful in time but what they really need is a chance to feel what it's like to assert yourself so i'll say great so tell me two things you'd like me to do differently or better in the, our coaching oh i could and then all of their the stories come up. Oh, I can't do that. Really? So what are you noticing right now as you're hearing my request? Oh, well, I, and then they would go off on these stories about how that's really hard for them. And so I just tell them there's no safer place on the planet for you right in this hour than right here. And if you can't do this here, you're not going to do it when you leave because there's too much pressure and there's too many countervailing narratives that are going to work against you and keep you where you are. And so we, that's why we use serious play. We bring humor, we bring play, we bring objects, we bring all kinds of things. What people need is in complete safety to try out parts of themselves they don't otherwise have a chance to express. And so we might even get them to, um, to exaggerate that. So somebody is trying to be assertive. You've just promoted, been promoted, you're now a four-star general. I want you to give me an order. I can't do that. And we have a little fun. No, just like pretend you're back in the movies. Like, what, like what's the cliche of a leader in a movie? And then and they do that. I said, look, and, and, like, triple down on that. Make that even more absurd. Why? Not because that's what. Not because that's what I want them to do. But I want them to feel that. And then they usually at some point burst out laughing, and and then go. I said, now no, dial it back a lot, and and find you know, what is your find your voice, find your breathing, find your posture to begin to feel like I, my identity is I'm someone who can assert himself or herself. Um, so that might be an entire coaching session is learning for the first time in their entire life to ask something of somebody else that way. Um, and then we can start to then extrapolate that. What would that look like? Where would you like to start with that in your team or at home? Uh, where's a safe place you can practice first outside of the coaching session? Um, and along the way, they're not if they're not able to do something, anything they tell you about why or about the scenario is based on the identity of somebody who can't do this. So it's like trying to help describe a place that you've never been. And so we want to give people experiences because now they have a new place to start from because they've actually now done this. They're now actually trying to migrate their identity to be somebody who does this. And I found that it just makes change much more sustainable in narrative coaching. Last two, and then I'll, um, is we, do, like I said, we work directly with whatever's in the field. We work directly with the elements of the stories they're presenting. And then we do a lot of work standing at thresholds with people when there's a new story about themselves or about life or about their situations emerging for them when they're trying to step into a big change for themselves. Um, uh, so I'm going to stop there again and just see if there's anything that's on your mind that you want to um, ask or share about. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. Anything coming up for any of you? All good. Anything you're appreciating that you're liking? Can you, David, can you give it more of a concrete example of working with, with, a narrative that is emerging and then experiencing coming with a client to a threshold where a new story emerges. Yeah. So I'll give you, 
you'll you'll hear this in the class if you come, but it's probably my most powerful example. And it was ironically the very first, um, it was the, a demonstration from my very first narrative coaching workshop. And I, I've never found a story that surpasses this one for me anyways. Um, so there was a gentleman that, um, it was a group of people that worked for, um, uh, the co they were coaches in a business school and they were, um, their director wanted me to come teach them some narrative coaching. And so we got to the point on the second day for um, a demonstration and the least likely person that I thought volunteered, it was a gentleman, a retired executive, pretty quiet, came from an engineering background. Um, not the kind of person you would think would jump up and volunteer for a demonstration. So, okay. Um, so uh, he sits down up front. We're sitting uh, in a kind of a circle in the group. Um, you know, what brings you here? What would you like to talk about? Well, we just moved house. Pretty, pretty kind of banal, kind of simple topic. And I said, so what's st what's standing out for you or what's important to you about moving house? He said, well, it's just really annoying. We've got all these boxes everywhere. And so the, the there was something about the way he talked about the word boxes that just was really intriguing to me. So we spent seven minutes doing nothing but talking about moving boxes, literally. Like, where are they? What do you notice about them? I said, and I said, so um, just kind of walk me through your new house. Well, it's smaller, so we've downsized. And there's something about that that seems significant, but we'll just note that. Um, and he, I said, walk me through all the different rooms. And somebody's walking, well, this one's mostly unpacked, and this one's a mess where no one's looking at that. And and then he, he got all done. And, and then all of a sudden, I sort of, I was walking with him as he was describing his new house and kind of why, you know, they'd moved and... Um, and there was some emotion out, some emotion for him in this, but it, it wasn't. It was hard to figure out why. And then it just sort of dawned on me. I said, "Well, you know, when I move, um, usually um, the first room I start to unpack is the kitchen, so I can have some things to eat while I'm unpacking." And and then I noticed he didn't even mention the kitchen, which it seemed really odd. And I don't know what any of this means yet. I'm not making any, I have no idea what this means. I'm just noting that the kitchen doesn't make it into the story. So I just ask him, I said, it's really interesting. You know, I just shared, I, I tend to unpack my, at least parts of my kitchen first to make a sandwich or something. And uh, I noticed that didn't show up in your story and it got really quiet. And he said, oh, and that's the worst one. That's, we, we, we've unpacked almost nothing from our uh, kitchen. We just haven't dealt with that. I said, huh. It's really interesting. Um, and again, I don't know what any of this means. I don't have any judgment about this. I just noticed this is an interesting turn of events in his story. Um, and so I just said, tell me some more about your kitchen. And there's like this long silence. And then I, I um, uh, and I don't, I wish I could remember because it was kind of a, uh, as we were all in a spell, but um, I basically just asked him again, so you know what what's happening in the kitchen? And um, and there's this again a very long pause. And I said to myself, whatever he's gonna say next is the turning point in, of this whole conversation. And you could hear a pin drop in the room. Everybody's like leaning in and what's he gonna say? And um and he uh he said, he just sort of quietly said, because my wife is dying. And so then there's this giant gasp in the room because no one knew that. And um, so uh, we asked him some more about, I just said, so tell me some more about that. And he said, it's her favorite room in the house. And she's got a degenerative illness, which means she's less and less able to cook. And it's too painful to be in the kitchen. They had They were normally the hub of their extended family. That's where they had a lot of the extended family gatherings. And they've moved to a small flat because she needs a smaller space. And it was too hard to be in the kitchen. So meanwhile, I, and I wasn't aware of this because I was totally focused on this man in this moment, but the entire room is crying because they're just so distraught over their dear friend. Um, and, um, and so we just found a way to gently bring that to a close for him. And, um, but that was 10 minutes. And literally, all we talked about after the first question was moving boxes. Because what we find is that the psyche uh, or the, the, 
the, the, the client is using this story to communicate things. So the story has a purpose, a purpose that's often unconscious, to, either unconscious to the client or um, not fully owned by the client yet. And so we're advocating for the story as much as we are for the client. What's the story doing here? What's it trying to get us to pay attention to? And so we don't need to have a lot of you know, powerful questions or deep questions. We just chatted about moving boxes because that was the vehicle that was safe enough for him to bring his declaration into the room. He, there's absolutely no way he would have started out, I'm here because my wife is dying. He's not going to say that, especially because he was very proud. He's you know, an older gentleman, kind of a different generation. This was hard for him. People were shocked that he had this much emotion and... Um, it was just, it was stunning to watch. And it just really cemented to me if we just trust the story and and if the client's ego or whatever is trying to direct the client, the story away from things or over-engineer the story, then yes, we can call them on that. But if we trust the intent of what the story's after and really help the story feel safe, the story will reveal um, the vast majority of the time what the client actually wants to talk about. And which will often be news to them. They're often as surprised by this as we are. So, anyways, that's what that would be an example. Thank you very much. Very You're helpful. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. And then we do a lot of things that are much simpler than that, not quite as dramatic, but it's all around um, we just try to honor the story that's told and um, work with whatever's presented. And sometimes we bring in new stories or we draw more attention to certain elements that might be not as visible or um, uh, stand out as much in the story because we feel like it might have some value in terms of helping the client begin to see himself or herself. Anything else for right now? How are folks doing? What are you thinking about all this? Perry. I'm really appreciating the way you're talking about silence. Um, something I value a lot in my life and in my work and, and I don't know, just the idea of really normalizing it in our practice mm. feels right. And I'm also thinking about how for me, it is sometimes a bit more challenging in this format than it was when I coached in person. In person, you know, there's a physical, you can use your physical presence to set, I don't know. It was just, there was more ease in being silent is what I'm noticing. And mm -hmm. so that's something I've uh, noticed ab about it. Um, yeah. I could say a lot more about silence, but anyway, I appreciate that as part yeah. of this practice very much. Yeah. And it, I mean, there are, you, um, you can, we can actually do more on screens than we realize, but it does take more effort and does take more um, development Um because we a lot of things we counted on for in presence, you know, we can sense more when we can, you know, feel the energy in the room and when we can see their whole body and, you know, we can see the environment. And so there are some limitations, but this is the world we live in and we'll continue to live in more as carbon becomes more and more of an issue. Um, and so, um, yeah. My, my... Yeah, no, Russ. yeah, go ahead, Russ. No, please. Okay, I'm right. just going to come in really briefly, and I, I suspect with this group of experienced coaches that there are elements of things you're talking about, David, that people are already practicing, Yes, uh, and I have that feeling, And but I really appreciate the kind of cohesion or the rigor you're bringing mm -hmm. to your model here of kind of, and Perry used the word um, confirm, or norm, normal, normalize. normalize. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, that's the experience I'm having listening to you of like, oh, yeah, this is a thing. <laughs> it yeah. is a thing uh, and, and i kind of it, it's bringing it together for me so that's yeah, just thank you a reflection yeah we do we do uh you uh many of our participants um express a sense of coming home in this work um not that all of it's new for them but it's like oh someone actually thought about this and there's actually a plan for this and what i thought was better all along uh, now i've got permission to go actually go do that um yeah Great, thank you. And Russ, did you want to share more? Um, well, I I have recently been attached to a couple of 
phrases. Um, one is meaning making. Um, and a new word I hadn't seen heard before is mattering. Um, but I'm uh, it, it seems significant in my life right now that I um, continue to um, try to understand uh, myself in relationship to my world and the meaning I make from meaning I make from that. But as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking we're not really talking about making meaning. It seems more like it's uh, revealing. Yeah. But I'd be curious how you think about that process of meaning uh, over the course of a coaching engagement. Yeah. Um, my observation is that many people confuse or conflate um, sense making and meaning making. So they want to understand something uh, and make sense of it, um, and which is, you know, is satisfying to most of us. Um, but um, if we go, so if you look at all the research, the um, uh, and you look at what supports outcomes for clients in psychotherapy or in coaching, the the client and all the things related to the client are have more impact than everything else put together by far. And we so a lot of what we're doing in this is um, equipping the client to make new meaning or make new sense. Um, and a lot of that has to do with not trying to push through too many things. I think of it more of as de a descent into something as opposed to a linear progression. Um, and so let's just take somebody as a precipitating event, like they've lost their job, right? So when so that we're helping them like what's significant for that what does that really mean to you you know first level meaning oh i've got no paycheck now or i've got no place to go on tuesday or there's some really practical simple things but as they drop into that what does that really mean to you and so they might drop through this sense of oh my god i'm panicking i don't have enough money or what am i going to do or you know and then they just drop some more oh wow there's a bit of freedom here oh i didn't really like that job anyways and oh and and then there's this dropping into what you're actually wanting to talk about with them, all of which are legitimate stages, all of which are important things to consider. Uh, but we're just looking at what's what, what level can we engage them to actually have the conversation they most want to have. Um, so we do work on that quite a bit. Um, and again, this is where it's important for us to be disciplined to not project our interpretations onto the client. And um, Okay, so I'm gonna go back to, we just, I think I have a few more, then I'll just tell you about the logistics of the program. Oh yeah, excellent, we're right there, hey. Oh, I'll, I'll, I can put this up, this will work. This was the last um, slide in this um, section. Um, this is a piece about silence. I'll tell you the story of this photo I took and when, if you come to the program. Um, yeah, and so most coaches are taught to ask great questions, then listen. We listen first, and then we ask second. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this was the last of this, and then I'll move into the details. So I'll let you read, read this heavily paraphrased quote from Albert Schweitzer. <clears throat> A little bit of Henry now and throw in. Um, so uh, everything that we're doing in narrative coaching is equipping the client. Um, and, um, the last thing I want my clients to feel is that they've been coached. <laughs> uh, and so we're trying to help them activate the healer in themselves. Um, and that just keeps me, that's what a part allows me going back to, I think what Anna was saying, it, it's what allows me and any of us to feel more relaxed when we're coaching. Uh, we're not doing anything to our client. We're actually helping them find themselves through their own stories. So here's kind of what the program looks like. So we have nine modules over nine months. Um, each, each week has a different purpose. Uh, they're kicked off by a live session with me where we kind of go over the core material for that module. Um, many of the modules have a bonus session as well that kind of, kind of goes deeper on 
uh, things like attachment theory or shadow or um, dealing with resistance, kind of more deeper into some of these topics, but this will be kind of the core material for the session. Um, and then in keeping with our own philosophy, we're um, going to send you the second week out into the field to do assignments. Uh, we have uh, a, a stretch assignments for each module. These are personal reflections or personal somatic experiences, again, beginning to feel this work for yourself and equip yourself to be able to work this way. And then the field assignment is um, <clears throat> uh, basically our invitations to go out and practice an element from that particular module. And um, and so just as a simple example of that, one of them uh, historically has been, um, I'm not sure yet if I'll do, use it again, but uh, in one of the modules, it's module two, we talk about attachment theory and one of the elements of attachment theory that's really important in narrative coaching is, are you willing to be with dissonance in a session? Are you willing to create dissonance in a session? Um, and so the field assignment might be, uh, go out to dinner this week and send your food back. Even if you reclaim it 30 seconds, five seconds later, say, I was just practicing an assignment. I want my food back. Because uh, I want to, if, if this is an issue for you, I want you to hear yourself um, being displeased and asking somebody to fix something. Why? Because if you can't send your dinner back, you're not going to confront a client. Or it's going to be harder for you to confront a client um, or just create dissonance by asking a hard question. And so these field assignments are just small little, the same thing we would do with the client. They're small little experiences to give you a taste of one of the key concepts from the um, <clears throat> so from the um, from the module. We do this here as opposed to giving you more information because we want to create these experiences for you, just like you would for your clients, and we want you to start sourcing what to do next from within your felt sense of what's going on, not because the model says you're supposed to do this. Um, in the narrative coaching model, it was built, which is also the design structure for the program. Um, it's all built around a rite of passage and integrates the stages of change, the stages of a story, and the stages of development. So people are changing themselves as they're changing their story, as they're moving through the coaching process. And so we want to give you these small little experiences so you have a taste of that for yourself. The third week, you'll come back with our faculty. So we have two amazing faculty that have worked with us for quite some time, Allison and Vicky. And um, we um, um, they do this session because they're closer to where you are than I am. And so they're, uh, they, they're traveling the same road. Um, and so they're really great for answering questions, sharing examples, helping you, kind of guiding you through some activities to kind of begin to implement more and more of what we've learned in the week one. And then the fourth week is exciting this year because uh, for the first time ever, we're, we've, we have a business partner now that has a really amazing platform to help support practice for coaches. And um, so I, I serve as an, an, uh, as an advisor to them and they're integrating more and more of, of my work in their platform, which is exciting. Um, and it's a way for you to, rather than just practice with your peers you actually can practice, record yourself and get feedback. And uh, you can choose to use the platform or not. It's available to you as part of the program. I highly recommend it because it's one thing to think about what you just did. It's another thing to see what you just did. And then we give you some resources and support tools to actually figure out how you want to improve based on what you saw. And again, the, the, just like with our clients, the purpose of coaching is not the conversation. It's what people do with the conversation. So we want to model that for you by giving you chances to practice um, as the best and fastest way to integrate what you've learned in that module. We also have an online forum uh, just for this class. Um, and so we'll post a lot of things there, give you chances to respond, to check in with each other, ask questions. Um, the faculty and I um, spend time there often uh, so we can answer any of the questions that you have. Um, and um, these are the sort of modules that we have. Again, these first three really start about you and kind of your approach to change and your approach to coaching and, um, and sort of the mindset that we bring in narrative coaching. This is where, um, to Terry's point, most of the unlearning happens, um, if, if, if there's any for you. 
Um, and then these are the next uh, two sort of sections. Um, one is going deeper on the narrative coaching process itself. And then th the last three are about specific narrative coaching skills um, to kind of bring this all to, to, to um, completion. Um, this is all the stuff that you get in along the way. Um, everything's recorded. So if you happen to miss a session because of work or you're not feeling well or you're traveling, everything's recorded. Um, we have um, uh, a number of resources that are available to us. There's a couple of tools that come up with every module just to kind of give you some structure around how to, how to use some of this. Um, we're building an alumni network. So by the middle of next year, about halfway through the program, you should be able to connect to other narrative coaches from around the world or maybe others that live in your same country. Um, we, um, for those of you who need um, training credit hours, we offer 53 of them. Um, and you'll get a certificate of completion. And then we're launching new things later in the year to build some certification processes for you as well. Um, Let's see if anything else here. Oh yeah, um, yeah, this is the things that are coming. Um, so I'm gonna just stop there. I don't think there's any, yeah, there's just, um, yeah, there we go. Um, so I just wanna stop there and I'll take the screen share down and to see if there's any either questions about the logistics of the program or anything else that's kind of coming to mind. Anna, you've got your hand, it's just, it's poised and ready to go. So when you say live, do yeah. you mean like this, right? Like this. Oh, okay. I, I, don't, come to, I don't come to your town and teach. No. <laughs> Good. Thanks. Yeah. But they're yeah, they're live sessions. Hello, Brenda. Um Hi. <laughs> how are you doing? Not too bad, recovering from COVID. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm with, I'm, I'm with you. I've had it since January. So <laughs> oh, it's yeah. awful. Mm. Yeah. Enjoy the session, Bella. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, any th thoughts or questions you have at this point? Is that for me? Uh, for anybody. It oh, could be, it could be, could be you, Brenda, if you've got something. If not, um. <laughs> no, I, I I got everything you said. I really truly love this um program, um, and it's as somebody mentioned, there's a lot of unlearning to do, and that's exactly it for me. On yeah. learning, you know, the question, I must ask this, I must do this, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the one of the hallmarks of my of my why I feel justified in saying some of that is um uh so I've I've one one uh, daughter uh, while she and I've been close her whole life, um she allows me to do to coach her because okay. it never feels like coaching ever. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to the point now where she's coaching her boyfriend. And, wow. and um, using some of the tools and we've got some really um, amazing um, uh, practices with chairs that we do in our live programs and she's been mm -hmm. with, with Mike uh, to help him make some decisions um, and so and she can do that because she doesn't feel like she's being coached yeah, yeah. just having an intentional conversation mm -hmm. yeah yes yes I I already um, asked you the question in the chat uh, window, Dave. Okay. Um, so the the live sessions are at six p.m. Eastern time. We offer every one of them twice correct? a day. No, they're twice a day. So we have one at okay. ten a.m. ten a.m. Okay. Eastern time. So that'll be much better for you. That's perfect. Yeah. Yes, because at twelve, <laughs> that's, uh, that's beyond my bedtime. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would it work? But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you're welcome to come to either one or both of them, whatever suits your schedule. I guess um, the question that comes to my mind about that is if you are participating in one of the cohorts and you go to another one, what the effect on the group or the field is by if you're not consistently in one or the other. Oh, the morning or the afternoon? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, well, I I, I have my theories, but I don't really know why, but it, it's common that the afternoon session is slightly smaller because it, you know, obviously none, none of the Europeans are there and, um, but um, it's also quieter. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it just <laughs> is. I don't know if it's because the Aussies come or the uh, Australasians come or whatever, but it tends to be quieter, a little bit more thoughtful. 
the morning, the people like the morning things. They're, they're as you can imagine, they're morning people. Uh, mm -hmm. Often, unless they're in Europe, they're not. But um, but it doesn't. I mean, so it's kind of fun. They like, oh, there's a visitor from. It's like having relatives visit or something. So they recognize them. So, but um, it's fine. It's totally fine. It doesn't really disrupt anything. And sometimes people really appreciate having some new faces in a session, uh, somebody new to talk to. Yeah, Perry. Perhaps you're going here, but I'm. I have a curiosity about just hearing you say a little bit about the distinction between um, this and the ID uh course sure. so that's yeah. possible thank you sure um so um like i said i i um i started um narrative coaching formally around 2002 um, but um even by then and for a long time after that i did a lot of projects in companies and in particularly in governments uh reinventing governments uh using this work and i kept getting asked because i was doing od and narrative coaching and I kept getting asked, can you scale a narrative coaching? And I said, well, yeah, yeah but not really. Um, and I was doing these projects where, um, uh, particularly through the governor of our state and some other things, where I, I um, was wearing many, many hats on the same project. And then there was a woman that heard me speak at a coaching and government kind of conference. And she wanted me to come to teach narrative coaching to I think they had like 200 employees and they they did um, services for disabled children. And I said, no, I won't do that. She goes, what do you mean? Consultants never say no. <laughs> and I said, because I know that you had to get a special grant to get that money. And I know how hard it is to get that kind of money. And I don't think that's going to give you what you want. And she said, well, what should we do instead? And I said, I don't know. Give me till tomorrow. And I went home and invented integrative development. What I did was I reviewed all these big projects I was doing for companies like Nike or for the state of Oregon or for the federal government where I was allowed to just be David. I had no title, no box, no nothing. And so I could talk to the governor one hour. I could talk to server builders in the next hour. I could talk to bureaucrats the next hour. It's all part of these large projects. So... I said, well, and that and I started to say, put all these little pieces together. And so I went back and I proposed this to her. And I and so and in that I realized that I couldn't do a training about this because it was a fundamentally different way of thinking about my role. And so we uh, we spent two years together re reinventing her entire organization from top to bottom, which in a government agency is pretty miraculous. And they did so well that they got the state legislature to change policy in their field because their results were so much better than everybody else's. So then I did reflect on that and say, what did I just do here? Like, what is this? Um, and, um, and so I began to slowly um, kind of build this out. And what it became in the end um, was a, a pretty provocative learning and development theory that's it's embedded in narrative coaching. It's what makes narrative coaching work. We just don't talk about it that way. Um, <clears throat> and then it, it started out for me, um, integrating adult development and organizational development into one practice. It was too, we're, we're, we're as siloed as the businesses we complain about. And I just started to realize that most of my clients' issues were systemic and, <clears throat> and, and personal at the same time. And so I'd be working on these uh, large projects for companies and they'd have all these coaches, all these training people, all these OD people, all these, every, there was like, it was chaos. And then they're wondering why nothing's make, nothing's changing. Um, and so we built this program called ID, which basically teaches you the methodology. Um, and and it, in a sense, if I just summarize it in a sentence, it equips you to liberate the learning and development potential in any moment in time any moment. Um, so whether you're running a facilitation or a training program or a leadership program, or you're in the middle of a change project, it's like what's possible right now in this moment that I can help leverage and make happen. Um, and then we had developed this other body of work um, called narrative release, which was sort of the encapsulation of the sort of psycho-spiritual philosophy that underpins all of this work. And we found that by bringing the NR work into ID, 
it gave the practitioners confidence to actually work this way. Like, what would it be like to run a leadership program with absolutely no curriculum? Um, what would it be like to um, <clears throat> turn your faculty into coaches? And so well, there's, and so we teach. I've got a whole bunch of case studies in the program, but it basically teaches you how to see yourself as a catalyst for growth in whatever you're doing, whether it's at the grocery store or at home or in a heavy duty leadership program. Um, and um, so we're, we have people that are doing amazing projects now where they're, um, they're with clients who are ready to, and one of the graphics we'll show you in the program is that um, there's an inverse relationship between what clients spend money on and what actually makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And we all know that we all collude with our clients because we get paid to, as a result of that collusion. We know that our trainings don't work most of the time, anywhere near what like we think they do. Um, the forgetting curve is steep. <laughs> and so, and a lot, but a lot of clients continue to try to hire us for things that we all know aren't really as effective as they could be. So I said, well, I, I, I won't live long enough and I'd have, I'd have to be 150 to see see changes in all of this. But I, I my commitment is to show my clients what else is possible. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the curve from the research and you divide up, let's say a, a program, you have pre-program, program and post-program. <clears throat> so the, on average, the program will consume itself will consume 80 plus percent of the budget and have to, less than a quarter of percent less about 25 percent of the contribution to value so you wasted 60 percent of your money on something that has no value and that's on a good day and there and and so and and, and just to be fair there are places where pure training is effective like getting people onboarded in a brand new job or around safety or things that are much more mechanical much more transactional and much more literal basic training like this is how you hold a knife to not cut your arm off <laughs> you know those kind of things but for the kind of uh, more softer skills that many of us work in they're not as effective and so uh, and the the pre program um um, has the second um, highest impact, um, uh, but the the post program support has by, by far the lowest contribution in terms of money that we put in, and by far has the highest return on value. But as we 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 walk away, we give them, you know, maybe some follow up coaching or something small. But so we so for some of the ID projects I share in the program. We actually invert use the, the client's own data uh, from client outcomes, and and um, we did this for a workforce development program, and we interviewed um, all of their all of their uh, uh, companies that hired these people. We interviewed all of them. We interviewed all the staff, and we found there was a, a completely opposite orientation between what the buyers wanted, what the people actually needed, and what the organization did. What the organization and so what it meant was that what the organization loved was training and assessing people that had almost zero impact on outcome in terms of um, clients uh, uh, graduates who kept their jobs and what the buyers and the participants really wanted was help after they got hired which was when most of them failed that were going to fail but there was no money left and there was no resources there were no programs and so and and so we ended up working with the director who also in, in bless his soul, he was near retirement anyways, but he, he retired. He said, this, this is a sea change. I, I can't, uh, it's going to take too long and I'm, I'm done. And I don't want to, I don't want to do that. So he left, which I thought was brilliant because if he hadn't left and he tried to fight this, they would have lost their contract because their results were so bad. And, um, and so we got them to um, uh, reshuffle their staff. Some of the staff didn't want to not be trainers anymore, so they didn't. They they, they were let go, um, and um, we they began the journey of restructuring uh, their entire organization in line with what actually made an impact for their clients. And they realized that they didn't have any people on their team that were qualified 
and experienced at working with people on jobs. They, they had spent a career working with people who didn't have jobs. <laughs> um, and so it, we, we start to realize, and, and, and a real catalyst from that bottles together and I'll stop, but um, was I read an interview once of the guy that had built the really famous um, programs at GE, leadership programs. And if I remember the story correctly, when he started, he did like what all people do often do, they, he went to the best business school, got the best speakers, had an extra, had best facilities, um, and uh, created a program that was extraordinarily well received and really popular. And people loved the experience. And then he realized one day to his horror, it made no impact on the business. And so he he then went out. To, he's he was wise enough. He said, "That's not acceptable." And we're not a pop. We're not a beauty contest. We have a job to do to make a better leadership team, teams. And so he went back and reinvented the whole thing from the ground up. And his big, um, his big mantra became, we need to stop sending changed people back into unchanged environments because the environment will always win. And, um, and, and for, going, um, so in narrative coaching, that's why we create experiences and experiments, not explanations and plans for later. Because if they're not going to do it with us, they're not going to do it later. Um, and so the ID just takes that and amps it up, you know, significantly, where we get people engaged in, uh, in uh, observing themselves in action. Um, most of the projects don't have a lot of training till far into the project because it, we don't really know what they need yet. Uh, they observe themselves. We teach them a bit of a co narrative coaching mindset so they can see things more clearly. We, there's a, some models we use to help them understand and frame what they're seeing. And then we invite them to inquire into themselves. So what, what, where would you like to begin and what would you like to do about this? Um, and But every development effort is enmeshed in an effort to change their system. Training and OD are not separated at all. They're done at the same time. So they learn as they try to change their system. And um, yeah. And so again, it's a very small subset of clients that are ready to work like this. But there's enough of them, and the more of them, the more that I think will. Um, for me, I just felt so. Dis I felt so. Um, after a decade or more of training, I just got so disillusioned. I thought, what a what a I won't say a waste of my life, but I said, there's got to be more than this. I can't. There's, I can't. And um, so, like in in my world, I don't do smiley sheets. I don't care what people think after we're done because I can't do anything to help them. If you didn't like my training, after I'm finished, it's not the time to tell me that because I can't help you. So if you don't like something, be an adult and speak up. And so we encourage people to please speak up. And this very first project that we did uh, at the disabilities program, there was a woman who was the head, uh, they had a bunch of nurses and sort of um, um, on the staff that worked with a lot of the kids. And she was the head nurse, was respected and revered and feared by everybody. She stood up in the middle of, and her boss is right there. She stood up in the middle of this orientation session. We were, we're an hour into the entire project. And she said, this is bullshit. This deadly silence in the room. And the, and the director's going, oh. And I said, so really, so tell me more about that. I, did, I didn't back down. I didn't attack her. I just said, tell me some more about what you mean. So well, we don't work this way. And he's went, a litany of all these things. And I, this is not, this is, this is bullshit. And, you know, and so I just said, would you be willing, we only have another hour and a half together. Would you be willing to stay for an hour and a half? And if you feel that way at the end, then that's okay. Don't participate. She was, oh, okay. She was expecting a fight. There's no, thing, no need to fight that. That's, that's what she believed. And, um, and I was just admiring her that she was willing to speak up. I thought it took a lot of gumption to do that. We get to the end of the orientation session and I ask, are there any questions or any thoughts? Do you have uh, reflections on the morning we've spent together to kick this off? The woman stands up again. <laughs> the giant room goes deadly silent again. Like, oh, what is she going to say now? She started crying. She said, I'm sorry. She said, I realized over the hour and a half that I was afraid because I didn't think I could do what you were suggesting we we're supposed to be doing. And I'm not, I'm not used to working that way. It scares me to death but I believe that this will be good for our kids. 
So for me, again, sort of like a narrative coaching, we're trying to help people be human, which we need more than ever now. Um, and so the ID way, um, a lot of people take narrative coaching. Most people take narrative coaching first and then do the ID way, but it's not required that way. Um, the beauty of this is you'll create your own ID practice. I created mine and I, I'll teach to that, but you will bring, we've had, we had two doctors in our program last year, one retired, one not trying to figure out how to help them redeem their healthcare career. Um, and uh, you'll find your way to your own version of this. Um, so it's more advanced in some ways, It's but for, for those of you who work more with groups or organizations, teams, um, ID might be more attractive. It's the same um, narrative release philosophy, um, uses a couple of the same tools, uh, it, but it just starts at a very different place outside the coaching construct. You can use some of it in coaching, but it's more designed for people and uh, like education and training and facilitation consulting. Thank you so much. It's so clear. Thank you. Yeah. Russ. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious as I have go, uh, reviewed a number of um, post program, um, post leadership program evaluations, pretty consistently the area that people express the most value in uh, is the relationships uh, mm -hmm. that they develop with each other. I'm curious about in with the ID program, um, what is what's your thought or intention around you know post program support between people, the relationships that are developed in the program? Well, um, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> yeah, in ID because we're working systemically, um, we're building working relationships that are often new for many people. And, and again, it takes a level of maturity to work this way that not every organization or every person is able to do. And so like, for example, one of the, um, one of the things I advocate for in um, with projects is that people are free to participate or not. I, say, I, I, I never take on projects where participation is mandatory because that dooms it to fail from the beginning. Um, and so it, it often falls on a, a traditional bell curve. A third of the people are ecstatic. They, they're like, whoa, it's like being in kindergarten. Like, yeah, let's, that, they can't wait to start. A third kind of like, oh, I don't know. This sounds really intriguing, but I don't know if we can do this. And a third say, I don't like this for a number of reasons. I say, great, don't waste our time and come, stay home. And, and then it's the boss's job to figure out what they want to, he or she wants to do about that. It's not my problem. I don't want you contaminating my system with your negativity yet. And, um, but we also don't judge them. We just say, great, be an adult, make your choice and let's go, let's move on. What I find is that um, the number one reason why the, 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 um, the those who opt out, the number one reason is because they're afraid. They don't say it that way, but that's what I observe. They don't, they don't, can't fathom themselves working like that because they've got so used to an other pattern. What happens over time is that the people who are out front first are having way more fun. Uh, there's more laughter, there's more joy, there's more enthusiasm, and they do better things. And then the people in the middle go, huh, these grumpy people over here are just like, well, we're not, you can't make us participate. These people over here are having fun and they're doing better jobs. We want to be like them. And so a lot of them end up migrating over. And so by the time we're done, usually about two thirds of the whatever entity we're working with end up participating. And then the boss gets to decide to do what to do with the one third. The disabilities woman, one of the things that she did for herself to model this was she and the HR director came in over the weekend, one weekend in the middle of the first year of the program, of the project, and rewrote every single job description to make coaching competencies or coaching capabilities a requirement to get hired there and a, and a, require, and a, and a metric in your performance review. So all of a sudden, now it's baked into the system. Um, and so again, you find people starting to really look at what are the levers of change we have? What do we? What would help people feel inspired to work this way? Um, yeah, and for me, it's just uh, uh, one of the ironies of the of the program. As I, I'm been working on two books on the topic, um, 
is that one of the number one sources of literature that I've consulted for creating ID uh, uh, comes from progressive child psychologists and educators. We know how to learn like this. We were wired to learn like this, not like we, school is an aberration. Training is an aberration. It was invented by capitalists and other people that want to keep people, you know. Um, and so we want to free, what you'll discover, um, uh, and, and there was a woman on one of these calls uh, last year who was who fought me on this for 10 minutes until she finally admitted, I'm just afraid. I've, I didn't like I didn't like kindergarten. <laughs> I like being told what to do. I said, well, then this may not be the right thing for you. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and you'll fit in and you'll do fine. I said, and I think most people, you know, um, uh, are hungry for a way of figuring out how to learn best for themselves, how to help each other learn, um, how to be more humanized in how we approach some of these things. And it just seems to fit better if we actually are as a species. Um, so, yeah. So we just have a few more minutes. Um, is there anything else I can do for you right now? No, this was really good. Thank you. You're welcome. So I assume you're going to follow up with an email saying, and here's what you do from the logistics perspective. Yes. Yeah. So Steve will send you an email after we're done. And um, uh, then if you, um, if you, if you have more questions, I hope you'll come and join us in either of the programs. Every now and then we have a few brave souls that do both at the same time, but um, uh, whatever one you choose is fine. Um, and, um, uh, and then if there's some, you have further questions, just reach out. You can book an appointment, have a conversation with me if you have more questions, but otherwise I'll hope you'll come and join us. Thank you. All right. Be Thank well, you. wherever you are in the world, take care of yourselves and um, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.